Greetings from Brazil. <laughs> I, I hope that you've been enjoying your time in Greece. Hopefully many people over here from Brazil have started watching already or will start soon. Uh, today I'll be talking about documentation or more precisely I'll be talking about my role as a technical writer, what sorts of things you, you need to think about when you're dealing with documentation, and several things I've read in books about technical documentation that might be interesting for you. I will not be focusing on technical aspects like language or certain decisions that you'll be doing while writing documentation. I'll be focusing on concepts that, that, are, that are majorly acknowledged, acknowledged in, in the field. So let's start. So a little about me, I am actually not a documentarian or technical writer by profession. I studied language and literature. I started working for KDE at the beginning of this year. And my, my route through KDE has been that of a jack of all trades. So I started with user support. I went to Wiggy's promo. I became a moderator for our KDE, the KDE subreddit. I went to websites. I, I wrote the Jekyll, the Jekyll tutorial, for example. Uh, I helped with bug triage. It wasn't for me. I started learning C++ and QML. And then I, and I finally settled on documentation. So I'll be talking about what I do. What is a technical writer? It can be it can be founded by several names: a documentarian, a technical communicator. A technical communicator is more accurate, a more accurate representation of the of the job because it has to do with how well you, how you communicate technical information for your audience, as you'll be seeing for, uh, very soon. Audience is the most important thing that you have to, to think about when writing documentation. So I took, I took a little quote from one of the books I've been reading. That is, technical writers, first and foremost, are testers and researchers. Their job is to know what people want to achieve and precisely how to achieve it. Communicating that knowledge is the last step of the process and it shouldn't take 10% of their time. And that's true. A bit of a hyperbole, but that's true. Most of the, most of the time you'll be trying to become a specialist in that field, a specialist in that specific area that you want to teach, and then you are able to teach. That's how you start with documentation. So you need knowledge first before you can, you can, before you can share knowledge. A technical writer does several things. Many are not listed here, but the most important I'd say would be if the documentation already exists, you need to improve it at several levels. As said before, you, you essentially communicate technical knowledge in a way that users will understand it. You will be handling monotonic things, so, so, so to speak, uh, such as formatting, typos, um, you'll be making the text more readable for the users, you'll be creating new content, and that's not just limited to text, you'll be also focusing on images, you need to explain to the user how, how to perform an action, and sometimes images really can explain uh, better than a thousand words. You also might handle UIs, technical, te certain technical skills are needed for some areas. So, for example, in development tutorials, it's, it's often the case that I need to code a very simple example that I can take a screenshot of so that the user can have a, a certain idea of what, the, of, of what the result is, what they should expect once they finish the tutorial. Lastly, uh, you should make it easy for readers to fulfill their tasks. So two important things. Audience is the most important thing to think about. 
and your audience wants to accomplish a task, that task should be as easy to do as possible, and that's done via documentation. So generally, in the documentation industry, from what I've seen, you generally have five steps that I that I literally just copy and pasted from uh, a certain book that will be listed at the end of, the, of this talk, which is the planning, the structure, the writing, the review, and the publish step. During the plan step, you, you need to think of areas that will be improved. Uh, you need to think of when to address certain issues, which are priorities, which should be done first, etc. At the structure phase, you'll, you'll be mostly thinking about how you will be handling these changes in the, docu in the documentation. Maybe you're writing the new documentation and you need to structure it into several headings, one after the other. Maybe you want a table of contents to, 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 start, to start with, since that will give a, a good idea of what you will be doing later. Sort of a skeleton. To work on then you then you have the writing step which is indeed the shortest step that you will take you have the review process which is when you you've already written the documentation you need to focus on language you need to focus on on formatting you want to focus on mechanical skills mechanical tasks i mean and then you go to the publish step, which is the final touches before you, you finally publish the documentation. So the, the one thing that is the goal of a, te a technical writer or documentarian or technical uh, communicator is to allow the users to complete their tasks. So for, for instance, API documentation should, should make it clear why, how to use it, how to use it, why you should use it, uh, and the technical proceedings to do so. Um, in tutorials, we'll be focusing on uh, accessible language, too. So each field has its own technicalities. So it's very, it's very common to see articles talking about what you should do when learning a new skill, when, when getting introduced to a new field. But the, I believe the most important thing that you should know, that you should focus on, is to avoid things to make you, that make you fail at your job. And what are those things? When the user cannot understand the documentation. So if there is no clarity, if it's if it's not accurate, if the language is insufficiently coherent, these sorts of things, the user will not understand it, and, and the documentation simply fails at delivering. When the user gives up on reading the, doc the documentation, so it has to do with the density of the documentation. If it's too dense, the person will might be overwhelmed. And if it's too terse, it might be lacking in information that is needed for, for, the, for, the, for your audience to understand how to accomplish the task. When the user can, cannot scan the documentation for what they seek, this is especially the case for API documentation, API being the code, yeah? Uh, usually, contrary to tutorials, when you're looking at API documentation, you want to scan for important information, the information that you find most useful. So the three most important things that make you fail as a technical writer, as, as a person writing documentation is when the documentation lies. So it's one thing to, to think about documentation that is outdated. Another is when the documentation is simply and plainly wrong. This is absolutely something that should be avoided at all, at all costs. 
there is the, the scenario when the documentation is broken. That is to say, uh, maybe someone wrote the documentation but never really tested the, the actual code examples, for example, or they've never made it sufficient for the task to be finished, to arrive at the end, or perhaps it's just riddled with broken links, broken images, inaccessible text, that sort of thing. And finally, when the user cannot achieve a task, that is one of the most important things. The documentation is there to accomplish a task. There is nothing more to say about this. <laughs> hmm. So, more in context, more on topic about KDE, we have to we have four main types of documentation that we use at KDE. Of course, there are more types that you can use, but these are the most important ones, and they are listed in order of difficulty namely wikis, tutorials, application manuals, and API documentation. The wikis are, in, are sort of interesting because you just need an account. You create an account with your email and suddenly you can change every content of the wiki. Uh, it's incredibly volatile content, that is to say, the content changes often. It's very easy to get started. You simply have a few wiki pages that teaching you how to write in, in the media wiki formatting that we use. It has no review process, that is to say, content added to the wikis are only reviewed after they are added. There is no review process before adding the content. And it has its place, yeah? It also has very few guidelines. Tutorials, on the other hand, are relatively static. They are a little more static than wikis. They require a GitLab or an Invent account. As you might know, Invent is the GitLab instance that we use for code. Um, it's easy to onboard now because I've added many many, many docs to help uh, improve the access to, you know, start contributing to KDE, to tutorials. It has a review process. The review process is done before the content is added. I'll probably be the one uh, reviewing your, your changes. You can, you can ping me directly if you have any, any, any sorts of questions. Um, it has a few guidelines, not too many, it's not overwhelming, and it uses simple markdown formatting. Markdown is probably the, the easiest way to add content nowadays on the internet, in an easily accessible way. Then we have application manuals. If you've used any sort of KD software, you might have seen um, at the help menu, you should see uh, a guidebook or application manual teaching you how to use the application, what steps are needed to accomplish certain tasks, etc. It's quite static because usually the features, usually software adds new features and, that's, and those features need the documentation. However, the features that are already there usually don't change behavior. So application manuals don't really require that many changes. It's very different from wikis, for example. So in the case of application manuals, if you want to contribute with documentation for your favorite software, you can write the documentation in Kate, for example, plain text. You can, you can use Markdown. You can write it in LibreOffice. You can do it directly in Docbook, etc. And then you can send it via email to the mailing list for documentation. Uh, or you can contribute directly by creating an invent account and going to, going to the project page and changing the doc book directly. 
So if you're not sending me, if you're not sending docs via email, you'll probably be re writing docbook, which is uh, which uses XML for formatting, and it can have a review process, but not not necessarily. It's quite open in this regard. Lastly, we have API documentation, which is quite static. That is to say, as long as you add quality documentation to, the, to your code, as long as you add quality documentation to your code, it will probably not change unless the code changes. Same, the same cases as application menus. It absolutely requires an event account. There's no other way. Uh, it has somewhat difficult onboarding because you, you, you have certain requirements before you can contribute to API, to API logs. Uh, you need to know C++ or QML, these sorts of things, before documenting it. Um, and you also need to be acquainted with the standard the standard tool used for generating documentation for code, that is Docsgen. It's not particularly difficult to learn, but it's way easier for developers. So, okay, I'll be talking about several important things about documentation, what aspects you should think about, should know about, and those are audience, navigation, accessibility, formatting, language, information disclosure, and levels of edit. This last one is kind of special. Um, but arguably, the most important thing that you, that you must think about is documentation is part of your product or software. No matter the book about technical writing, they will be very clear about uh, documentation being part of your software, being part of the products that you ship to users. So the same, the same sorts of issues, the same categories of issues might apply, such as technical debt, or for example, you wouldn't ship code that is broken for your users, and you should do the same with documentation. You shouldn't ship broken documentation to your users. So the first thing, audience, that's also the case of every book, every book about documentation will have this. You need to think about the person who will be reading your documentation. So a common mistake when you're starting to learn about documentation is, oh, okay, that, that's probably the same thing as a persona, right? But that's not really the case. A persona, as mentioned in user experience, I believe, uh, has to do with, it's more like a tool that you use to characterize a specific kind of user, whereas the audience that you want to, to focus on will be a range of multiple personas, multiple possible personas, and for that you need to account to their status, their roles, if they are a user, an administrator, a developer, if they have any other uh, changes in levels of experience. So for instance, a tutorial will focus way more on users who are not well acquainted with code in general, maybe. Meanwhile, API documentation will be focusing on people who are able to read API, who are, who are, let's say, who are seeking specific information, not learning in a new, a new skill. So that has to do with the minimal expectations of what, it, what the readers of your documentation will be. Uh, what are the use cases that your users will have for the documentation, for the products that you are shipping? Again, this has to do with accomplishing tasks. The use cases of your users are the most important thing that, that 
needs to be addressed in your documentation. You don't necessarily need to cover all use cases. You need to cover the, the most important ones, of course. Yeah, the audience is everything. I really need to hammer this in your heads, really. The audience is everything. And by consequence, you always need to think like your audience when you are reviewing your documentation. If you read the documentation as if you were an inexperienced uh, an inexperienced developer, for, for instance, you will be able to notice several issues that when addressed will be, will be making the documentation way more accessible. Okay, navigation. I got a little quote from another book again. One stop information lookup and retrieval, that is to say, your user should not leave the website for the documentation unless it's for third party information or unfamiliar terms, for example. <clears throat> that is to say, add the links everywhere that, that really helps. Uh, yeah, and you need to add categorizations to make it easier for the user to find themselves there. Accessibility, is it readable? Can you understand the text and, and view the text correctly? Is it linkable? Can you, can you access it easily via a link? It's not behind a sort of wall blocking the content, etc. Is it exposed? So this is important. If you need several clicks to find the documentation, then maybe you should consider using a flatter hierarchy. A flat hierarchy is preferable, way less clicks, way easier to find things. The audience must know it exists. You must know it's accessible to them. Formatting, probably the most important things here are parallel constructions and lists. Parallel constructions and lists are pretty much, if you have a very large paragraph detailing, detailing information, that is parallel, several, several bits of information that could be put si side by side. You can use a list to make it more presentable. That, among other things, will help improve the readability of your documentation. Language. So you don't necessarily need to focus on language. I have a history with language, so that's a strong focus for me. Uh, but that's not necessarily how you will contribute to the, to the to KDE. But the important resources that you, you that you might want to look at are style guides. We have a few style guides. We have a style guide and, and formatting guide for our tutorials. You need to think of the language that your audience will be most comfortable with. You will need to make the text consistent to make sure that it is high quality, not just quality documentation, it's high quality documentation. Uh, and, and arguably the most important, clarity and accuracy. If the text is accurate, then it works. And if it's clear, the user will keep reading. Mm, information disclosure. Uh, so you need to disclose the information for your users in a palatable manner, let's say, let's say that. So don't overwhelm users with information, don't info dump. However, don't be extremely brief. Uh, be sure to provide the needed information for your user, for, for instance, unfamiliar terms, Give them keywords so that they can search themselves for the, for the knowledge they need. Uh, and the, the levels of edit. I'll not be talking about the levels of edit. However, all, all of these things that I just went through are sort of a recharacterization of levels of edit. These are the sorts of things that you can edit in a text or rather, these are the types of edit. It's from a book from 1976. It's standard in the editing industry. And you can think of it as the possible ways you can contribute to the documentation. 
Hmm. You don't need, yeah, last thing, you don't need to focus on everything at, at the same time. You should really focus only on specific things, especially if you're just starting with, with contributions to KDE. So I have a few, I have a few additional concepts that I can skip a few since we are sort of short on time. But yeah, accurate descriptions are better than buzzwords. This is something that I that I've learned from my time at KD Promo and that I've seen confirmed in books about about documentation. That is, don't use buzzwords. Don't do that. I'll be honest, BS that you will be finding on company websites, for example, just to promote your product. You should use merit or actual benefits to tell your user, yeah, you should use this. You should this you should, you should use this product. To accomplish a goal, your user really doesn't care about buzzwordy descriptions that actually describe nothing. Knowing that the documentation exists sometimes can be can be better than how to use it because your audience is not dumb. Sometimes you you don't really have the time to write comprehensive or or full fledged documentation. Maybe you just want to hint at something existing so that the user can learn by themselves. Maybe they, after learning, will come back to contribute to you to KDE. Yeah, another important thing. Um, telling the user it, it exists is useful. Telling them what it is or why to use it is even more important because if the, if the user doesn't want to use it, doesn't see why to use it, your product, there is no need to explain how it works or how to, they should use it. This is a golden rule that, that I've found elsewhere, but couldn't find the source. Never document the future. Never make promises. Only talk about the present. Promises are commitment, and you might not be there to provide that commitment later on. Maybe someone else, but you really shouldn't be relying on the future. Documentation is really not the place for this sort of thing. One important thing to, to keep in mind is the curse of knowledge. It's very self-explanatory. You know a lot of things, therefore you might think that the user knows more than they, than they really do. That's why it's very important for you to think, for you to read your documentation as if you were your audience. No overlap or duplication. So if you can, Make the text such that it can be linked later by someone else. Probably the most important thing. Also link to existing explanations. Don't You don't need to repeat things all the time. But if you do, be short and brief, and brief about it. And sometimes duplication is fine as long as it helps make the text more clear for your users. This is... An interesting topic. <laughs> so there's the concept of topics and procedures. Procedures are documentation that focuses on how, how to use the software, how to use the product, how to accomplish a task. They are action focused. And there are topics which people often don't really focus on, but is very important too. It answers specific questions, who, what, when, where, why, and they have their roles in documentation. And you can be exp very explaining, so to, so to speak, as long as you don't go the overwhelming way. <laughs> as long as you don't be overwhelming. How to address problems when you are working with other people on documentation. 
There are two types of problems, global problems and local problems. Global problems should be addressed once, for instance, oh, okay, you are an experienced documentarian, you are reviewing a, uh, an addition that someone wants to add to the product, you find certain issues that are present in all of their changes, this is a global, this is a global problem, you mention it once for the other person to fix themselves. Local problems are very situational, they are topical, they appear very occasionally. Now, if the problems happen very often, if you find those problems often, uh, you should propose guidelines to for future contributions. Lastly, guidelines and, and style guides, these sorts of things can be broken. You can do some different things based on your experience, based on, on the reality of the situation, on what really looks good in your documentation. For example, a standard in the industry is to use you, second person, singular, for the users, but we use, but we use we. Uh, there are reasons for that, but I'll not be going about this right now. <clears throat> Very important for the sustainability of, a, of an open source project, document what you've learned when writing documentation so that the next person can work on it. Okay, I'm just finishing this. Uh, I didn't really have time to explain Agile, which is very important. Uh, the managerial aspects of teamwork and documentation, how to manage reader feedback, how to measure the quality of the documentation and other such things. I'll be going uh, very briefly about the, a few resources to learn more, but I think I can already open this time for questions, if there are any. I'll be jumping from one slide to the other so that people who see this recording will be able to read it properly. So, questions? Okay. Hmm. All right. So if there are questions from the audience, and I'm not... Meanwhile, of these resources that are listed here, the, the ones I would most recommend for you to start with would be this functional doc documentation and the product is docs. And docs for developers. So if you're, if you're a developer, this is the obvious answer. If you are just starting and want to know the sorts of things to avoid, the sorts of things to follow, then this functional doc documentation, if you, read, if you want a general over, uh, overview of the whole process, including corporate and enterprise scenarios, then you would do, then you'll be interested in the product stocks. Technical writing process is interesting for those people who want to know uh, the methodical aspects of managing documentation. All right, there don't seem to be any questions here in the room. For English, for language specifically, I can recommend the Chicago Manual of Style, specifically the 17th edition at least. No questions, okay. Is someone on? This presentation was very brief, but I hope you, you've enjoyed. <laughs> so there's one. Oh, okay. We have one last question. Yeah. Are there particular KDE docs you would point to as a reference, as really well done? This is known as an air gaps questioning system. It's are there particular KDE docs that are particularly good as reference? 
Um, so I've added the style guide for the developer tutorial. You can find it at developed.kde.org. It will be listed at the end of the documentation area. Uh, I've also listed a few personal recommendations for resources that you can that you can read about. Let me just get on there to see a few of them. <clears throat> it's also on the sidebar. Style guidelines. I have special recommendation that is the Google Developer Documentation Style Guide. It's very, very, very good. Red Hat and OpenSUSE also have them. Okay. Next person then. <laughs> Hope you have a, a nice evening.